Well, welcome back to Voice of Reason Radio. Your host, Chris Honholtz and Richard Story, joining you on this April 9th, 2022. Yeah, we missed last week. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, we missed last week because I literally had back-to-back events. Um, and uh, they were things like my son's 18th birthday. So really couldn't get out of that. Um, and uh, there were just other things going on, family events. And so there was, I, I actually texted Rich and I said, uh, I'm sorry. I just looked at the calendar and, and well, <laughs> so we missed last week. We just had no time. It has been crazy busy, but we appreciate you being with us again this week. Thank you for your time and thank you for your patience with us when we do have those misses and, and uh, we try to keep them as, as minimal as possible. But we do appreciate you being with us and uh, joining us. We want to remind you we are part of the Christian Podcast community. We always encourage you to check out the Christian Podcast community. You will always find really good programming on there. Uh, In fact, I do want to share one other podcast that uh, I'm going to encourage you guys to go check out. And it's our good friend Justin Bullington who has started the Theo Bros Podcast. Justin stole my idea. Uh, no, not really. Uh, we, as you know, we have the uh, the Theo Bros uh, Twitter account, and uh, you know, kind of dovetailing off of that, along with some other folks who have kind of grabbed that name and, and are using it. Where one pe- some people like to call it a slur, where uh, some of us are trying to use it as a positive. Well, J- uh, Justin Bullington is in fact doing just that. He has just started it. their little short podcast. You're talking. You know, 15 minutes, 12 minutes, I think seven minutes. They're just short little podcasts that you can listen as you go. And he's done three so far, but it's called the it's called Theo Bros Podcast. I'll put the link in the show notes. It's on Anchor FM, Anchor.fm. And uh, if you just look up Theo Bros Podcast on there, you will find it. But we will definitely add this in the show notes. But he's had three so far. What is the gospel? Should Christians be nice? Oh, that was a good one. And uh, can I be sure that I'm saved? So far, that's what he's put out. Definitely want you to tune into that. That's not part of the Christian podcast community yet. Justin. Justin, you need to go check it out. Come on get in there. Um, but I would definitely want to encourage you. In fact, I want to get Justin on, Rich. I didn't tell you this. He, They've got an upcoming conference that he's going to be speaking at, and some of our friends from Twitter and, and pastors that we know are going to be putting, they're putting this on. So I'm going to try and get Justin on here to talk about that. That's coming up later this year. So uh, he can have him plug his podcast and plug that conference. I think you guys would be really blessed by it if you can get there. But I uh, want you to check that out. Again, check out the Christian Podcast Community. You will always find some really good podcast material on there. And as always, we encourage you to check out our website, slavetothekingcom That is where you will find all our connections for social media, uh, where you can find merchandise for the, the show if you want to help promote it, if you want to join us on our Patreon, and if you want to get a hold of us, there is the Contact Us page there. So please, please, please uh, check us out on there and get uh, signed up and follow as all the new stuff comes up when we can do that. So... I appreciate you guys. Uh, we always try to get those that stuff in first and foremost because I forget if I don't. And uh, we want you to be able to get all that information. I am so glad, to, again, to be back with my brother this week. Rich, how are you doing, my friend? Better than I expected. Thank oh! You, Aaron Chandler. <laughs> Threw me a curveball. He, <laughs> he actually he came up with that one. Better than I expected. And, and I, I made a mental note of that. Because that's a comment that he made to you after your video last week of your attempt at playing Daredevil on the trampoline. And it it was a joke reference back to what I normally say. But he said, better than I expected. So tonight I am better than I expected, thanks to Darren Chandler. Yeah. No, that was, you know, again, it was my son's birthday party. He chose to have all his friends at the trampoline you know, uh, a place called Defy Air. Um, really neat setup. But if you're 48 years old and out of shape, let's just say I'm still feeling some of the damage in my back. So <laughs> better than I deserve is probably an answer after that tumble I took. So, uh, yeah, no. yeah, that was fun. And we enjoyed it. But yes, yes, uh, brothers, it's really good to have you back. Um, really appreciate it when the Lord can put us both together. Uh, you know, as, as everybody knows, we sometimes have these hits and misses and uh, it's I always so greatly appreciate it when we can come together. Uh, folks, want to 
it, we'll want to start with something a little bit different. We do try to include this often, but if you are tuned into this program, I'm going to assume that you profess the Christian faith. But presuming that you... Before, prof- oh, go ahead, brother. I was going to say, let me give you a lead-in even to this. Okay. In today's world, we look across and, and watch the television news. We watch and read Twitter and Facebook and all the other social media platforms. And, you know, we, we, we tend to look at ourselves in different camps. You have like Ukraine versus Russia. And in the United States, there are, you know, millions of different camps against other camps. You know, you got Republicans versus Democrats, liberals versus Republicans or liberals versus conservatives. And even within the American church, you've got all these different factions fighting. We've got to remember that it's actually sin is man's greatest enemy. Sin is mankind's greatest enemy. And we have to remember that as Christians. And even if you're tuning into this program tonight and you're not a Christian, maybe you're of a different faith, maybe you're an atheist, maybe you're a hardcore liberal carrying pro everything under the sun type person. We desperately ask and plead for you to stay tuned long enough to listen to the following message. Amen. Amen. Folks, as we, as we were saying, I mean, we assume that many people who tune into this are professing Christians, but there's a difference between a professing Christian and one who is genuinely in the faith, one who is possessed by Christ himself. And so I just want to share this with you because it's easy to say, I'm a Christian, and, and it's it's easy to proclaim that, and there are so many people that proclaim it, and then what then comes from their mouth or comes in the actions that they live uh, live by each day <clears throat> do not line up with the Word of God. So let us present this to you before we get into the meat of this topic tonight. We are crea- we are God's creation. We are created in Him, His image and His likeness. But be, being created by God, being His created in His image and His likeness doesn't mean that we're children of God. As people say, God reserves that for people who are genuinely His, who have been purchased by Christ's blood. And, and to be a child of God is, is something different than just simply being a person created in His image. There's something more unique to that. And the reason I say that is you're going to hear something very offensive and you're not going to like it. And if you're not in Christ, you're definitely not going to like it. And that is that you are at war with God. You're actually hated by God. This is where people get really mad when I say this. But see, God says that he hates sin. Sin is that which we are bound up in. How can how can you possibly say that, Chris? You don't even know me. Because scripture is clear that when Adam sinned in the garden, and yes, we believe in a little a literal Adam and in a literal Eve here, in their literal garden, where the, the, they ate of the fruit and rebelled against God. When, they, when Adam purposefully, willfully ate the fruit for which he was forbidden, he plunged mankind into sin. And what happened is that all of creation, all of it, was affected. You, me, the, you know, the rocks, the trees... Everything was affected. But the unique difference is that we were affected in that our nature changed. We became bound up and uh, shackled up in sin. We are sinners by nature. See, you don't become a, become a sinner because you did something sinful. You sin because you are a sinner by nature. You are down to the core a sinner because you are at war with God. You were bound in sin. You were born into sin. And how do, how can you possibly say that? Well, I can tell you because the, the definition of sin is lawlessness. And lawlessness is that which is antithetical to God. God is perfect. He is righteous. He is good. He is holy. Christ himself said there is only one who is good, God. We can define obedience, righteousness, lawfulness by looking to God. So we know that lying, for example, is is sin because God doesn't lie. God is nothing but truth. We know that uh, lo- you know to hate is sinful because uh, you know there's a perfect hatred by which God which God hates that which is uh, against him, that which defies him, that which is 
uh, unholy and unrighteous, but we don't hate in that way. When we hate, we hate for personal reasons. We hate because we are offended rather than uh, for God's sake and for God's purposes. But God is love. God is love in that he manifested his love in Jesus Christ and what he came to do for us. So we know that when we hate another person because they're just, a, we don't like them, that we are actually offending God and, uh, and, and being at war with God because God's love is a perfect love and we can't love the way he does. So when he gives us his, when he, you know, demonstrates his holiness, his righteousness in the revealing of the law, which we see in the in the Old Testament, things like we are to have no other gods bef- uh, but Him, and other, and so we can't create an image of God in our uh, something that we like and we feel comfortable with. Rather, we have to truthfully and uh, wholly and completely worship and love the God who created us. That is a reflection of who He is. When He says that you're not to steal, you're not to take something that doesn't belong to you. It's because God is the a perfect provider and God is uh, at per- perfect contentment with that which he has and so for us to steal is for us to to war with God's nature and to say you didn't give me enough when he when he is uh, when we when he says to not bear fault bear false witness we are again at war with God because God is is never a liar he never lies he is always truth he is the truth he is the only truth and so when we lie we say God you're not worthy of that we don't I, I don't have to be reflective of who you are you know we when we go through the law and we say oh you know we to obey our parents and to honor them no 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 I don't want to they're terrible people though I don't like who they are they're 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 restrictive of me they don't understand me yet God is the perfect father and so when he says to obey our parents and to honor them we are to honor them as we would honor God and when we don't honor them we're not honoring God see the law reflects what we are we are not who God is. God is perfect. God is holy. We are not. And so the law exposes, uh, uh, Paul in, in writing to the Romans said that the you know he didn't know what coveting was until he saw the law. And the law woke his heart up to a, a whole new set of sins. He just, Now he coveted just because he was told, don't covet. The law exposed the, the willful sinfulness of his heart. See, he didn't you know, he didn't covet, and then God decided, no, that's a sin. God said you're not to covet. In other words, desire something that doesn't belong to you, something he hasn't been provided to you. And so when he said, don't do that, what did Paul's heart say? Oh, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to uh, covet. I want to have something that doesn't belong to me. Because the, you know, the very nature of Paul's heart and your heart is to do exactly the opposite of what God tells you to do. So when you do these things, when you steal time from your employer, when you are defiant to your parents, when you lie about your uh, your taxes, or you are dishonest about what, what time you showed up to work, uh, when you when you decide that God is okay with certain sins, you know, certainly he understands that I'm just, I'm weak in this area. So he's not going to judge me for that sin. You've created a God of your own image. See, God's law reveals what you are at heart. It's not that disobeying the law is what made you a sinner. It's that you disobey the law because you are a sinner. And the law, which is perfect, righteous, holy, and good, can't save you because the law can't change your heart. The law only, the law only reveals how wicked your heart really is. And so when the Bible says that all all have fallen short of the glory of God. It is pointing out the fact that God's word reveals we aren't him and we're not as good as him and we never can be. And so if God is righteous, holy, and good, and he's got a world full of sinners who hate and defy him because they aren't him and they want to be him and they want to live their lives according to their rules and not his, well, God has to be righteous in his judgments. He has to confront you with your sin and he has to hold you accountable for your sin. See, the thing is, though, God is perfectly righteous. He is the perfect, righteous, holy judge. And he can't just let sin slide. He can't give it a slap on the wrist. He is the infinite holiness, goodness, righteousness in the universe. He is all that makes everything right and good. And so when you stand before him 
in his perfection and you stand before him in your lawlessness, there's only one possible judgment he can give you. He can't just wink and let you in because that would be a bad judge, a judge who says, well, you've defied everything I ever told you and you've hated me in your heart since your, uh, since the moment you walked out of the womb. Yeah, come on in. No, that's unrighteous. That's unjust. He can't do that because he's perfect. So he must say, as a perfect, righteous, eternal, holy judge, he must punish your sin. And there's only one suitable punishment for offending a perfectly righteous and eternal God. And that's eternity in hell. Chris, that's so mean. How do you say that? Because I know the God that will he would condemn me to hell today if it weren't for his saving work in me. I deserve that. I can list laundry, uh, a, a huge laundry list of sins for you. That, uh, but any one of them, the first lie I ever told, the first time I stole a toy from a, a store, the first time I was dishonest with my parents, every one of those would be worthy of condemning me to hell. And he would be right to do so. That is what you face. If you are not in Christ. That is what you face because you can't defend yourself. You can't buy God off. You can't provide anything to him to make an excuse for your behavior. You are a criminal before the judge. There's no walking out of the courtroom. There's no parole. There's no probation. There's no early release. There's no wheel and deal. There's no, uh, there's no plea bargain. You are going to be judged eternally for your sin. And there's nothing you get to do to change that. Yet God in his infinite righteousness, holiness, and love made a way. See, God himself cannot just say, no, I'm not going to punish you. There still has to be a satisfaction. A satisfaction of the legal requirement of the law. Because as we stand before God... Our sin has a one wage, that is death, and it's an eternal death in the, in the fires of hell. So, what, what, what does he do? How does he make himself yet the, how does he be just and yet be the justifier of those who have sinned? He sent his son, his perfect, righteous, holy son, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, who took on humanity. And he became the second Adam. He became the man who stood in our place, where Adam stood in our place in the garden and failed. This Adam did not. He is our representative because he is fully God, he's fully man, and he can stand before God because he's fully God, and he can stand in our place and be our representative. And so what he did is he came to earth, he took on humanity, yet lived in all those years, not one time sinning, and never in thought, word, or deed. He was always perfectly obedient to the Father and kept all that the Father commanded. And then, at the end of his earthly life, he willingly went to the cross. He took the penalty for sin. See, the penalty is death. Christ took the perfect wrath of God upon himself, the death on the cross, the righteous wrath of God poured out on him at Golgotha so that he could stand in the place of sinners. See, now the penalty is poured out on him. And he can save sinners because he stood in their place. Now, how does one become a child of God? How does one come to Christ and trust in him? How does one become saved from this fiery death that we all face? It is to repent, to recognize that we are sinners before God and turn from that sin, to turn to Christ and trust wholly and completely in his completed work. See, apart from that, you have no hope. You cannot save yourself. Yet Christ has said he will save you through his work. See, none come to the Father but by Christ. And it is Christ who took your penalty if you will turn to him and trust in him alone. And you complete and trust in his complete work. And so he took the wrath of God. He went to the grave. He rose from the grave three days later, rising himself from the grave, defeating sin and death in your place, if you will but trust in him. You have to trust in Christ and his completed work. 
that he is the one who stood in your place. And guess what happens that day? Not only is the penalty paid for, but then something even more magnificent happens. You are no longer just a blank slate where your the debt that you have accrued is filled to the uh, the top of the line, and now it's just a, a zero balance. No, he gives you even more. He gives you his righteousness. He takes his righteousness and puts it in on you, and you stand before God as if you are having the full righteousness of Christ. And so now when God stands and looks at you on Judgment Day, you don't stand there as someone who is drenched in the uh, guilt and shame of sin, shackled to, the, to the, 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 the sinful nature. Rather, you are poured out, uh, the righteousness of Christ is poured out upon you. Not something you earn, not something you deserve, but given to you as a gift. And now, he doesn't have to judge you. He can take you in and adopt you as his son or his daughter. And now your sins are forgiven and you are a child of God because you're now adopted into his family. You're no longer a rebel at war with him, but you are a child adopted into his family. So when we say it's one thing to profess Christ, but it's another to be possessed by Christ, this is what we mean. So if you do not know, if you are not sure, if you do not cannot say that you ever have been possessed by Christ, then stop what you're listening to. Stop what you're doing. Get down on your hands and knees and pray and cry out to God. Ask Him for the, to be gifted with repentance. Ask Him for the gift of faith that you might turn to Christ and live. That is the message that this podcast is based around. And there is no greater message. I don't care what anybody else has to offer. It, it pales in comparison to the, the, the eternal salvation that is in Christ through the gospel. Rich, anything to add? Just that the one that got me when the Lord blessed me with salvation and I truly understood everything that you just said, the one that got me was Jesus Christ said to look with lust means that you've already committed adultery in your heart. God not only judges your deeds, he judges your thought life. He judges your heart. He judges your desires. So when you look at another person that is not your spouse, you are committing lust in the heart when you desire that person. When you open those magazines and you open those websites that's full of nudity, you are lusting. You are committing sexual immorality in your heart, and you will be judged according to God's perfect standard. And when Chris said and quoted scripture that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that's not a loophole for you to sin. That's not an excuse for you to compare yourself to other people. That's a condemnation against you from God himself, testifying that no one outside of Christ will be worthy in God's sight for the gift of salvation that is only accomplished through the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. And if you're not saved, if you hate God, if you maybe just think that you're saved, or if you just wonder if you're saved, go to your knees and beg God and grant him and ask him to grant you the gift of salvation. Ask him to grant you the gift of assurance, knowing that you're truly saved. Because in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, Jesus himself said, On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these mighty works and miracles in your name? And he will look at them and say, Depart from me, I never knew you. He was not talking to people of the world. He was talking to people that professed to follow him. He was talking to people that professed to be in him. So it doesn't matter if you know God. It doesn't matter if you think you know Christ. The thing that matters is whether you are known by him and how you are known by him. Are you looked at through are you looked at by God through Christ as a child in Christ, as a brother in Christ, or are you looked at as a child of the world, a child of the flesh, a child of Satan? There's only one of two answers to that question. You're either saved or you're not. 
And if you're saved, you're truly saved. And you can have assurance. But there's false assurance in this world. And there's nothing that you need to be more certain about because your eternity depends on it. Go to Christ. Go to God. Beg and plead and pray until you know for sure. Until you can look and know for certain that you've not only changed your mind and attitude about sin and about Christ, but your entire life has been transformed by the message of Christ. Amen. Amen. So, folks, we wanted to start with that because this topic we're about to get into, and by the way, we're going to give you a little bit of a warning here. This is going to get into some sensitive material. We're not going to get overtly crass and and you know say things that are um, salacious, but the topic, especially in light of um, well, let's just say it kind of stems from the, the bill that passed in Florida recently and how everybody's all up in arms over, gee, we can't tell kids uh, certain things about their bodies and certain things about uh, you know certain lifestyles without parental permission. So um, one, I'm putting it that way so you guys are kind of cued in because if you're listening and your children are present, this might be a good time to have them, you know, Go play with their friends. Maybe pause this. Listen to it another time when they're uh, busy doing something else. Not because, again, we're not going to get into you know any kind of gross detail, but it's a sensitive topic, and it is our belief, as we will get into into this discussion, that the persons that need to uh, be able to talk to them about it is you, parent. It's not the state, it's not the school, it's not the television, it's not anybody else. Parents, you are the only ones that should be talking to them about this. So we want to get into that tonight. So wanted to put that topic out there because um, when we talk about the Christian faith and we talk about the things of the Christian faith, we are wanting to make sure that um, that uh, individuals are, they are coming at this as Christians. That they are coming at this with a right and biblical understanding. And being outside of Christ means that you're not going to approach this with a biblical perspective. So we want you to, before you even get started in this discussion, to understand that this is a discussion that Christians should understand, should have a right uh, biblical understanding of. And should, in fact, then uh, be looking at it from that perspective and that we're going to do this God's way and not the world's way. So that being kind of the setup and, and that being how we've presented the gospel message to you and you've now had sufficient time to you know, think about whether you wanted to have the kids do something else, play with Legos, go to the other room, or listen to this at an alternative time. We are now going to talk about um, the the phrase that everybody is arguing about, the word groomer. That That's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to talk about it because everybody's favorite so-called Christian slash conservative writer, David French, decided to take uh, Christians and conservatives to task for using the word groomer in reference to people who are quite vocally in opposition to Florida's law, which now says that basically, I think it's fourth grade, I think it's fourth grade, that you cannot teach LGBTQIA, I don't know how many other letters, uh, curriculum without, here's a big shock, parental permission. You actually have to get the parents involved before you can teach them this stuff. And so what has happened is, has been an outcry of the weirdest order. Um, so much so that Disney, the, the safe for the whole family, not so much, uh, company, Disney has taken very vocal stances. They had a walkout. Now that now there's actually video out there of Zoom meetings where they're basically saying we're going to have a, all this a, a additional inclusion, which they've been doing. If you want, I think it was uh, Mark Rufo. Let me let me see if I can find the name again. Uh, but he he shared numerous videos of a Zoom meeting with 
uh, it was the reimagined tomorrow. Christopher Rufo, I think he's a uh, he is a writer for City Journal. Uh, you know, one of the more uh, prolific cr uh, conservative uh, individuals out there on social media. He found he got access to all these uh, Zoom meetings. This Walt Disney Company reimagined tomorrow thing that they had, and there were numerous clips of individuals who were saying they had that the, they had this not so secret. Not all secret, gay, uh, not at all secret gay agenda. Excuse me, and they were adding queerness to to children's programs. That they were making queer characters more and more front and center. That they were going to have up to a minimum of fifty percent of underrepresented uh, LGBTQIA and other underrepresented minorities uh, as primary characters in their shows. Uh, that they were going to have a tracker system of sorts to make sure that they had uh, enough gender non-conforming characters and can canonical trans characters and bisexual characters. Meaning that they want to make sure these are people in the story who will be part of the story and you will know their story. And I say that with scary air quotes. Um, and so and even going so far as to make sure that the, 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 the parks with their attractions are taking away uh, comments of ladies, gentlemen, uh, you know, boys, girls, taking all that away to be quote unquote more inclusive. So they've taken a major role in this. And so basically the, the lobbyists, the anti uh, parental rights individuals have come out in full attack mode and actually misrepresenting big shock what the law is about, which is to say, oh, you can't say the word gay. No, what you can't do is teach LGBT, LGBTQIA plus propaganda without parental permission. It's been utterly misrepresented, okay. but that's what's going on. Yes, brother. One key word that Disney used in that quote and almost every pro-gay organization I'm not getting into all the alphabets. When yes. I say gay, everyone knows what I'm talking about. Every pro-gay organization, there's a key word in that all of them, just about all of them have started using. That's the word minority. Yes. They have achieved what they set out to do 20 years ago to convince the world that being one of those letters in the gay alphabet means you are a minority. Just like if you were a black skin or brown skin or Asian or Hispanic or whatever, they have convinced this country and numerous, numerous people that being gay now makes you a minority. That mm -hmm. includes you under all the umbrella of the civil rights movement, which they accomplished at renaming and they, it's now known as the social justice movement mm -hmm. because just this week before we even discussed tonight's show, I was watching something and a woman was referencing her grandparents or her parents that had walked, had marched on Selma with Martin Luther King Jr. They didn't say civil rights movement. They said and used the phrase social justice movement. So it's not just a matter of the pro-gay agenda trying to infiltrate schools. It's trying to infiltrate every aspect of civilization of society and has achieved what it set out to achieve. It has convinced the leaders in our country and corporations in our country that being gay makes you as much a minority as being Asian in this country does. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the whole point is to, to, you know, create that persona that this is a minority and they need to be protected. And that's been going on for decades now. So in all of this, a lot of folks, I and, and I'll make an argument as to why I think it's an appropriate way, although I do prefer what Jer Daryl Harrison says. I'll talk, say that in a minute. But a, the, a lot of individuals started using the term groomer. Now, groomer, they're basically saying is that these individuals who absolutely want unfettered access to kids in the classroom and in other places to teach them this this ideology are grooming these children and we can talk we'll talk about what we mean by grooming in the in, in the traditional sense but that's the terms that's getting used basically you're it's it's calling someone pro pedophilia okay 
and that you are grooming children for inappropriate uh, sexual thinking and behavior. And so individuals who are, are calling out, I believe rightly so, those who have gone on the attack against parental rights and who have gone on the attack with the idea that you cannot uh, just have unfettered access to kids with this ideology. So enter David French. And I'll read through this quickly. Uh, David French does a, I think, a five-tweet post where he says on Twitter, The slinging of the word groomer or insinuations of sympathy for pedophilia by the same people who spent years standing for the man, uh, by the way, standing means basically fanboying, standing for the man who appeared in Playboy video centerfold Playmate 2000 Bernola twins, and that might be the la least worst thing he did, is just too much. I mean, these guys relentlessly attacked folks who held Trump to the same standard they held Bell, they held Bell, Bell, Bill Clinton. The American Family Association even launched a petition against me because they said we should not uh, that because I said we should hold Trump to the same standards we held Clinton. Interestingly, he the petition that he lists is one talking about Franklin Graham deserves your report and uh, David French's character assassination was unconscionable. So I don't think that's why they held the petition, Mr. French. Anyway, uh, so, and he talks about here, you can sign it, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, and the, most importantly, this dumbing down of the term grooming is deeply harmful to actual victims of sexual predation. Grooming is a real thing. Just ask the victims of one of the worst sexual abuse scandals you've, you've never heard of. And then he gives a link to an article. And he says, redefining grooming and slinging false accusations for, of sympathy for pedophilia is pure malice. Blue checks doing it on this website know better, but lots of ordinary folks don't. They hear, they, they hear the words and apply their ordinary meaning. That's incredibly dangerous. So that was David French. David French has been on the attack uh, against politically conservative-minded conservative Christians, well, ever since they started voting for Trump in 2016. So let's talk about this. There's two parts I see to his argument here. And so the and the reason we're talking about this is not to attack David French, because David French, quite honestly, is an easy target. Uh, he's really made himself an easy target as of late. He might as well just, you know, switch labels and, and you know, call himself progressive. But um, the two parts are important because there are a lot of evangelical elites, kind of big names, who echo a lot of this who echo the mindset behind these. And there are a lot of Christians who can get caught in the wake of this. So again, David French, that'd be an easy target. We're not, we're not going to go after David French. We're going to go after his ludicrous argument though. So the, there's two parts. The first part is he's addressing hypocrisy. He, uh, what well, he is seen as hypocrisy. The first is to say that there are Christians who supported Trump. They're hypocrites for calling out people who are saying uh, that the anti-parental rights, pro-LGBT, folks are groomers. So he's saying, if you voted for Trump, if you're a supporter of Trump, you're a hypocrite. And how dare you call the, use this word groomer? Why? Because he believe, you know, he appeals that uh, to the, the, these are individuals who's fanboyed over Trump, who has an obviously sordid past with regard to sexual, sexually immoral associations. Now I'll tell you right now, there's no question that Trump is, we talked about it in 2016, Rich, you and I talked about many of Trump's serious moral issues. We talked about this. We're not going to deny that that happened. So, but what he's saying is if you supported Trump and you fanboyed over Trump, as he would say, um, and he's got this terrible past, how you are a hypocrite and you have no business even getting into this discussion and using this term groomer. Additionally, he claims that, uh, he, uh, that supporters of Trump attacked Though uh, never Trumpers, I guess, would be the way we would kind of refer to it, kind of what he and and others uh, positions are. They're never Trumpers in any way, shape or form. He says, if you were a supporter of Trump, you attacked those individuals who were against Trump because and tried to hold Trump to the same Clinton or standard that Clinton was held to. Now, remember, Clinton was in office. He was sexually inappropriate with, uh, you know, Monica Lewinsky and you know, he lied about it under oath. He gets, uh, you know, he actually gets, um, you know, he, uh, what's the word I'm looking at? They did it twice, three times to Trump. Uh, uh, impeached. He's actually impeached, and but the, the, he remained in office. So he's saying, 
when the Christians saw what Clinton did, we had this high standard of what a, pre a president should be. But you guys abandoned that when tr uh, when we said we should hold Trump to that same standard, and you attacked us. So okay, it, go ahead. I got to chime in. Go ahead first, and we did, and you and Andrew Rapport did a great episode a few weeks back. The first problem is even those outside of Christ think the word conservative and Christian mean the same thing. <laughs> Sadly, many within the Christian community consider them the same thing. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, there's a huge difference between being a truly born-again biblical Christian versus being a conservative. Next, when it comes to the standard of a president, it's the standard as anyone else. The standard is not man to man. The standard is how man appears before God. Mm -hmm. All of these men were sexually immoral at some point in their lives, whether in thought, word, or deed, period. Yeah. And the problem is he defeats his own argument. The fact that the term groomer is being applied to true pedophiles in itself is an abomination mm -hmm. to victims of pedophilia because you're downplaying the crime, you're downplaying the criminal, you're downplaying the act itself by giving it a sugar-coated sounding word. Oh, absolutely. The word groomer in itself should be offensive to any and everyone. No one should be referring to pedophiles as groomers. You should call them what they are, sexual deviants, which you were going to lead to here in just a little bit. But yeah. that's what they should be called, or sexual deviants, yeah. not groomers, making it sound like someone that's a mentor trying to shape and lead someone. But call them what they are, sexual deviants, period. Absolutely. I, the, I, worst, oh, go ahead. the worst, the worst sort of sorts, I mean, the worst kind of sorts. Anyone that would harm a child in that way, in my opinion, deserves any and everything. And they will get it when they stand before God on Judgment Day. And it's only in Christ that they can be truly saved. But in my opinion and in my fleshly mind, I have my own opinion what should happen to everyone that is convicted mm -hmm. and truly guilty of pedophilia. Oh, yeah. But oh. let's not sugarcoat the term period, whether you're pro-gay, anti-gay, whatever. Let's call it what it is. Instead of using the term groomer to try to whitewash the sound of it, let's stick with pedo pedophiles. Let's stick with sexual deviants because that's a more descriptive, more accurate description to begin with. No, absolutely. I love what Daryl Harrison said on this uh, just the other day. He said, stop calling them groomers. They're deviant sexual predators whose hearts are an abyss of sinful depravity. Romans 1, 28 through 32, 2 Corinthians 4 through 4. They are children of the devil who desire to do the deeds of the one whose nature inhabits them. John 8, 44, 1 John 3, 8 and 10. Now, I, I the thing is, is that Daryl is not going to disagree. Is not going to hold the position that David French uh, holds here. P believe me, he's actually saying that we ought to go one step further than just saying using the term "groomer" for these pro, um, you know, child manipulative uh, propaganda. He's saying call them what they are, as you said, deviant sexual predators. So, but getting back to David French's first part of his argument here, what he's basically saying is if you supported Trump and you were not willing to hold him to the standard that he felt you should have held him to regarding his sexual degeneracy, then you have no place calling out those who are admittedly trying to force LGBTQIA propaganda on children. Now, understand that. He says it is, uh, you know, that it is just too much. That if you use the word groomer, it is just too much. If you supported Trump, you know, in spite of all his terrible moral background, you have no place. And if you told someone, yes, I know he's got a terrible background, but the difference is here's this candidate, here's this candidate, this is why I'm voting for Trump, and you, we're not in the situation that you're describing here that you know, we're dealing with with, uh, with uh, Clinton. He's saying you're a hypocrite. You attacked him. You are not holding the same standard, and therefore you have no right to speak here. You're being silenced by this part of the argument. The other part I have a of question. Yes, go ahead. In 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 that context, isn't that a self defeating statement? Because <laughs> he's doing the exact same yes. thing he's accusing others of doing. Oh, absolutely. That the ones that have broad stroke the term groomer for the pro gay 
public school education, and he's saying that if you voted for Trump, that automatically makes you this, this, or this. Mm-hmm. Isn't he guilty of doing exactly what he, what he's accusing others of doing? Yeah, but that's how that's how um, that's that's how leftism and progressivism works. You know, the standard is never applied to oneself. So anyway, <laughs> so I, I'm sorry, folks. He 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 abandoned the conservative position a long time ago. All right, so the second part of the argument has to do with the word groomer, that you can't use that. Now, according to French, the term groomer can only be used to, uh, to child sexual predators. Okay, we're talking about those, you know, straight up pedophiles who harm children. And that's the only place it can be used. And if we use it for anything else, if we broad brush it as he would kind of claim that we're doing, um, then. And by the way, I would love this to be what Daryl says, deviant sexual predators. But we're using this term because this is what is kind of the term that's running around. And it's the one that David French and others are, are complaining that we shouldn't be using. So that's why we're sticking with that term. Um, but groomer can only be used in that context. So he insists if you use it in a different context, if you expand it to refer to what's going on right now, you're dumbing it down and you're harming victims of actual groomers. So you can't use the term groomer to describe people who want unfettered access to children in order to secretly teach them about LGBTQIA propaganda because you'd be dumbing down uh, the term. So you can't use it because you you were supportive of a person who had a a very questionable so, uh, uh, social history. He had very deviant morality. There's no question about that. And you can't use it because how dare you use that? You're actually harming the victims of actual grooming and pedophilia. So let's let's uh, go down through these arguments and talk about why. Uh, I, I think. Just listening, to, reading through it, I think most people can recognize there are some serious problems with David French's logic, if you can call it that. Um, and I, I want to be careful. It's so easy. Like I said, he's an easy target. I shouldn't do that. So my apologies. But um, let's start with the first argument, the, the issue of his hypocrisy. And again, we're addressing this not because French is an easy target, but because I guarantee you, you, you all you have to do is spend some time online, you're going to see high-profile evangelicals and other you know, professing Christians holding these arguments. And so we want to address them because you're going to stand in, in the middle of these arguments. You're as a parent going to be facing this. And you are trying to determine how do I approach this? How do I look at this? How do I understand this? And these are voices trying to tell you, you can't say it that way. You're not being nice. Okay. So the first argument, the hypocrisies, according to French, calling individuals who are supportive of bringing secretive LGBT, uh, you know, propaganda curriculum into the schools Calling them groomers is, you can't do that because you're a hypocrite, okay? And the question is, does being a hypocrite ne- negate the possibility that a hypocrite can still speak truth? In other words, he says, it's hypocritical for you to say that because you supported this man. So you have no standing, no right to, to address this topic. You can't use this word because you're a hypocrite. But... And this is where people are, you know, we are all guilty of this. I did this with today when my wife and I were talking, when the the, the topic of the CDC came up and they were going to study uh, myocarditis, which is some people are claiming is the uh, byproduct of uh, the vaccines for in young people. And I made a comment as I wouldn't trust the CDC to do a study about the common cold. Why? Because the CDC has become very political. If the CDC did a study on myocarditis and got something right, I... I I have to be able to look at it and go, they've got this right. Their hypocrisy in the past cannot taint that uh, my ability to recognize truth. Okay, so despite my desire to want to dismiss the CDC, I can't say, well, they have this. This can't possibly be right because, well, it's the CDC. They're hypocrites. I have to be able to look at the context of the uh, and the content of what they're presenting to determine if they're being truthful. Now, a person of ongoing hypocrisy and and untruthfulness, etc., means I'm going to have to look a lot more closely to to determine if it's true, but I can't just simply say, well, there's no way this person's telling the truth. We tend to want to do that, okay? But 
a, a somebody, even the worst criminal, you know, even the worst predator can still say things that are true. Okay. If a man who was a predator hurt someone, went to prison, came out, and then someone attacked him, he has as much right to report that he was attacked and be hell and, and to be, have his case investigated and, and have justice done on his part, even though he's a terrible person, right? We have to be able to say that. So what's happening here is you have with, uh, with David French that he is saying as a hip, because you are a quote hypocrite by his standard, you are, you have no standing to use this term and make this judgment. So I, I would say that you the, the the natural response to the question, which is, a person may have acted hypocritically, but does that preclude them from having made a truthful statement? No, the answer is no. That does not preclude the possibility of making a truthful statement. So we have to evaluate the statement based on the evidence at hand. Does it comport with the actual evidence at hand? So David French is wrong when he says that. Uh, your support for Trump equates to support, or let, let me back that up, I'm getting ahead of myself. He's wrong when he says your support for Trump makes you a hypocrite, therefore it is basically laughable or it's too much that you're using this term. You don't have a right to. Well, putting the, aside the issue of Trump, if the term is true, if the description of what is happening is true, whether I supported Trump or anyone else in the past has no bearing on that. So French's argument falls on its face there. Additionally, his argument heavily relies on the idea that supporting Trump equates to supporting his past immoral behavior. Remember that these are people that he has, and, and I had to go look the word up. I, I thought maybe he did a typo, standing, S-T-A-N-N-I-N-G. I had to go look this word up because I thought, oh, this has to be a typo. But it's, an, uh, it's to be overzealous or an obsessive fan of a particular celebrity. So it's an actual word, uh, you know. David French taught me something. <laughs> Sorry, I have to admit that. But um, so what he's saying is, you know, if you know the when a person uses the word groomer, it's such a joke because you were fanboying after a, a, a guy who was in a, a a Playboy video centerfold. Okay, hold on. Are you saying that because I supported Trump, and you're and you're and your words fanboying over him, that I actually supported? his being in that video. That is illogical. And I could say that with certainty because, Rich, there were many Christians, and, and I know you and I both did, because in 2016, you and I were not Trump supporters. We, we argued on this program against him being president, uh, against voting for him. And it was over the fo following four years, which is another part of the argument I want to make here, that our attitude toward that changed. But the idea that you supported his Trump's immoral behavior is illogical because many Christians and even many conservatives recognized if I, in voting for him, they were voting for someone who had serious, quite you know, serious questionable moral issues. But the comparison was him or the person who he was running against, Hillary Clinton who guaranteed greater access to abortion, greater uh, you know, advancement of LGBT issues, assaults on free speech, assaults upon li religious liberty. These were her talking points. So in, in David French's mind, it doesn't matter who you were voting against. If you supported Trump, and, and this has been a stance of his for a while, you were accepting of his past immoral behavior. And I, and I will agree with David French on this. I saw some of this, and I know, Rich, you did too, and I know our listeners have. There were people <clears throat> who completely whitewashed Trump. I mean, they said he was, oh, they fully accepted him as a Christian. They, you know, oh, oh, that's just past stuff. You can't use that. I mean, there, there were some serious double standards that went on. And there were people during his four years that if Trump did something wrong and said something wrong, and there were times that he did, they, they completely ignored it. And if you tried to call him on it, they completely attacked you. So in some respect, he's right. There was some of that going on, but not all of them. 
In fact, quite a few of us were very vocal about, man, we need to see him off Twitter. Man, he needs to stop stirring the pot. He needs, you know, when he's got, when he spoke this speech, he did really well. But when he got over here, he was just being antagonistic. There were many issues that many Christians, even though they voted for him, were willing to call out and say, this is wrong and we want him to act like an actual president. <coughs> so David French ignores that and says, if you voted for him, you're supportive of him, okay? So, you know, that was happening, but the people that voted for him in many cases were voting, as, as many have said, look, I'm voting for him to get the job done. I know he's got issues, but French doesn't accept that. French says, you know, you had to not vote for him altogether. So his argument has been is that there's just simply no excusable reason for, for a Christian to ever have him voted for Trump in his mind, it's beyond the pale, and he literally takes every opportunity to attack uh, politically conservative Christians and conservatives in general for their uh, any public stance that he sees as being in favor of, of Trump or something that comes from Trump's legacy. So, I'm sorry, that's not an actual argument. That's sour grapes. It is, let, me, let me just ask, ask you a question to kind yes. of clarify a little bit. Is he saying that if you were against this bill, that automatically meant that you were a Trump supporter? No, but if you watch what he's done in his recent articles, he's I don't think I don't think that David French would be in favor of pro LGBT legislation. I don't I don't believe that's what he would uh, ever admit. But what he's saying is if you are looking at the individuals who are who hate Florida's new bill and hate Ron DeSantis and say, we should have unfettered access to kids. If you say, dude, you're a groomer. He looks at that and equates that with the mentality of Trump. And he's saying, uh, uh, and so he's saying, you guys are just too much. You, you supported a terrible person. And now you want to use this term. Well, for one thing, liberals are still trying to rally the anti-Trump cry because you know there are some rumors that trump may run again but the trump issue aside let's look at the bill itself and, and that issue for just a moment first thing why do they have a problem with parental permission prior to this curriculum being introduced into the schools the, it, and the bill itself it didn't say we want all of this banned it said that Parents had to approve before their children went through this, but the advocates for it wanted to be able to teach it to children without parental consent. That is a red flag in itself. But my question is why? What is in that that they don't want parents knowing that their children are being exposed to? That in itself would be a red flag. And one reason why that broad based term groomer has been applied to all those supporting <laughs> that bill because especially, well, any children, but especially when you talk in kindergarten, first, second, and third grade, why on earth or what on earth are you wanting to introduce that parents would oppose and you're wanting the right to bring that into the schoolroom without parental consent? Yeah, uh, suspicion right off the bat is going to think make someone think that you're up to something. I mean, I've read some articles from some very very pro gay adv advocacy groups that were against the bill itself mm -hmm. because um, they didn't want to be implied as trying to introduce something harmful without parental consent. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the portion of this people have missed is that they were wanting to bring this teaching in without parental consent. And if I understand the way the bill passed, it requires parental yes. consent. It's not banning the teaching, but it's saying that a parent has to approve their yes. children to sit through this. Okay. That in itself, like I said, the fact that they're wanting to bring this in without parental permission is very, very questionable. Yes. Um, I, I would have, felt better if the governor said no we're not going to introduce any of this at all we're not going to allow this in the school rooms because we've seen it going around online both of us and have read it first off 
homosexual teaching does not belong in public school. No teaching about sexuality belongs in school. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, biology and, um, sex education classes that back umpteen hundred years ago when I was in seventh grade, I had a sex education class in seventh grade and my parents had to sign a permission slip for me to go through that teaching. Um, there's another little caveat. Um, they're upset that they're wanting to introduce this without parental permission. I got news for them. Um, sex education, as far as I know, still requires parental consent. Even today among most public schools, whether it's regardless of what they're teaching, just basic biology 101, when it comes to human sexuality and reproduction, parents still have to sign a permission slip. So why are they wanting to be exempted from what's the status quo? And I think that's what the governor in Florida was trying to do is saying, we, we already provide sex education and parents have to approve their children going through it. Um, okay, you want to introduce this? Well, you're going to have to go by the same standard as everyone else. But, you know, they scream, no, we don't want our parents and we don't want parents knowing what we're bringing in. First off, in my opinion, sex education needs to stay out of the classroom and, and that be between parents and their children. But under no circumstance ever should kindergarten, first, second, third grade ever be exposed to any type of discussion discussion revolving around sexuality, much less gender and homosexuality and all these other type of worldly desires and pleasures. And uh, I want to get on that in just a moment later on, because I know we're getting a little close on time, but that's, that's the real question is why are they wanting to subvert parental permission and subvert what parents know about what's going on in schools? Hadn't that been the, the rally cry of the public school education system for the last three decades, the parents aren't involved enough. The parents need to be more aware of what's going on in the classroom. Now, all of a sudden, no, we don't want the parents knowing what we're doing. Yeah. Is that not the image that you're getting? Well, and that's exactly it. In fact, you actually have some states where they have um, sex education and classes like this where parents cannot opt out. They, they cannot opt children out. And so what you're seeing as more of this material is becoming, more parents are becoming more aware of what's going on, they demand to know what's being taught in those classrooms. And I think the thing that really brought a lot of this to a head was COVID, as crazy as this sounds. When COVID hit and schools locked their doors and everything went to Zoom online, what happened? Parents were home and were starting to pay attention to what was being taught. Teachers freaked. They completely freaked. Why? The, the, the parents can't be, the, uh, be uh, on the, on, in the Zoom meeting. They can't be in the same room. There's, there's other kids and there's privacy issues. What do you mean privacy issues? What are you teaching or what are you talking about that the parents can't know? And that is, I think, what suddenly became that kind of laser target that, that suddenly lit up and everybody went, say what? And they started paying closer attention. And when things like critical race theory, critical gender theory, and all these other things started coming up, people started demanding to know what was in the curriculum and school districts and teachers unions and teachers started losing their minds because now they no longer had unfettered access to the children. The parents were starting to get involved again, which is why suddenly the Department of Justice comes out, thanks to the you know, teachers unions sending them a letter saying, you really need to start calling these parents domestic terrorists. Suddenly the Department of Justice starts calling parents domestic terrorists. So there's been a barrier there. And this is where, unfortunately, and, and we can get into a whole other topic for a whole other time about you know, two, you know, two family, you know, two parent working kids being, uh, you know, you know, uh, raised by the school system, raised by social media, etc. A lot of this is finally starting to come to light and a lot of parents are starting to get more involved. So let's move into that second part of the argument, because what you're talking about plays into this. According to David French, and there are others who are saying similar things, the word groomer is an inappropriate term. It cannot be used. 
because the term has traditionally been applied to sexual predators who seek to manipulate and isolate their victims so that they can co coerce them into their sexual deviancy. And, and Rich, you found a, an interesting link. I've never heard of this website called TN, TNTips.com, TN but it actually had a, a list of, of answers to the term, uh, to the question, what is a groomer in a relationship? And you know, one of the ones that uh, that was interesting in here is it says grooming is the slow, methodical, intentional process of manipulating a person to a point where they can be victimized. Eric Marlowe Garrison, a sex counselor and author, tells Allure after the perpetrators find their targets, they gain their trust and move in from there. And then another one uh, says here that gr uh, grooming is when someone builds a relationship, trust, and emotional connection with a child or young person so they can manipulate, exploit, and abuse them. Groomers may also build a relationship with young person's families or friends and make to make them uh, seem trustworthy, authoritative. They can, and uh, there was somewhere else that also refer refers to trying to isolate the victim, giving them gifts and special attention, kind of drawing them in and cutting them off from. Uh, from everyone else. So the, when you're talking about grooming in the sense of a sexual predator, what you're often talking about, especially when you're dealing with people who are pedophiles, is they will they want to sexually assault someone, young person uh, or vulnerable person. And so what they will do is try to build this relationship in which they can manipulate and then coerce that person into being uh, assaulted by them. And so you can see a lot of things happen. Uh, they, they're, they're the friendly person. They're the guy that lets them come over to the house. They, uh, you, you, know, you can you know, uh, read all my comic books. You can play my games. You can, uh, you know, oh yeah, parents, sure, I'll let you, uh, I'll watch the kids. You know, no, you don't have to pay me anything. And they, over time, what they're trying to do is, is build a relationship of trust. And then they start morphing. And so it might just start from simple stuff to where they're to they're starting to let him h have whatever they want. Oh, you you want you want get I, I give you gifts. Oh, oh, you you want you want candy. Oh, hey, here psst, you can. Uh, yeah, I'm drinking a beer. No, no, do, do, yeah, I'll let you have some, but don't tell your mom and dad. Um. Oh yeah, no, no, yeah, we can watch that movie. Shh, just don't don't tell anybody because man, we could get in trouble for this. And it becomes their little secret. And then it's the the touching and the and the hugs and the and then it's the emotional manipulation and they start oh it's okay everybody does this no 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 you you, you know don't worry about it no oh no you shh, don't tell anybody i'm going to get in trouble and it's through these the, uh, emotional manipulation threats messing with the mind and then even threats of physical harm they begin to break down the barriers to get what the predator wants okay so that's what we're talking about when we think about a pedophile grooming someone okay that's that's what we're talking about so French says, if you use the term groomer in this more broad sense to talk about people who are pro LGBT uh, curriculum and propaganda in the classroom in, in in your kids' faces without your knowledge, that's wrong that's that's downplaying the victims of uh, a person who has uh, been victimized by a sexual predator so Let's talk about that. What the, what that actually means? What? Why is he saying that's too specific and we can't use it? I, I think what is being what is being used when that term is being said. And by the way, I agree that there are people who are using this as this broad based slur, slap in the face, and being just being snarky. We don't need to do that. But using the term to express what's going on, I disagree with French wholeheartedly on this. I would. Again, I would go with Daryl, go up, take it one step further, sexually devi deviant predator. But I saw something that somebody shared. Um, I think it was Delano Squires uh, who shared this. It was James Lindsay. Now, James Lindsay is an atheist. James Lindsay is not a Christian. James Lindsay, however, does make good observations of what's going on within the circles of critical theory, race theory, queer theory. He's got a good book that actually talks about that called uh, Cynical Theories. About halfway through it, I need to finish it. Um, so he's a smart guy, but smart and on the right track for the wrong reasons. Because outside of uh, a biblical worldview, James Lindsay can only express his opinion. So, But James Lindsay gave his definition of grooming. 
And I think this is entirely appropriate when we just talked about what grooming is. He says, grooming, the deliberate act of bringing a child into a sexual, political, or racial ideology, practice, cult, or lifestyle without the knowledge or consent of uh, his or her parents for the aim of isolating them from their family so the external party can abuse and manipulate them. I think that's an excellent definition. Why? What's been going on in recent years? Schools are beginning to teach more and more LGBT curriculum without parental approval. And we saw this explode, like we talked about, with the Zoom uh, with, with the Zoom schooling, when more parents started becoming aware of what was being taught. Um, you've got, if you ever want to just like beat your head against the wall and, and get that migraine, watch libs of TikTok on Twitter. Um, they have been showing no end of teachers people calling themselves teachers in, in classrooms, so I'm, I'm assuming they're being, they're being truthful, where they're saying, we're going to teach your kids this. This is how we do this. This is what I... Uh, we have a, a, a change closet where they can come in with uh, the, the clothing the parent approves of, and then they can change in the closet with no judgment and be the, the gender that they choose to be. This is, this is being publicly posted by people who say they are teachers. There are more and more of them objecting to parental approval. We just saw this in Florida. Um, they are there are situations where parents are coming forward and saying, "My kids have been taught by the school to say that they are a a different gender. They have been put on hormone blockers without my knowledge. They have been given a name, a different name in their school records without my knowledge. And then when I finally got involved, you're going to cause your child to commit suicide. This is happening in schools. And there being a lot of it is being done without parental knowledge. They are teaching children. They, they, they're, there was an individual that was on a new show, and I can't remember, I wish I had the link, where he was upset that he wasn't going to be able to te teach his kids who were like in kindergarten, and he wasn't going to be able to talk about he and his partners, his husband, um, which is not a true term, but that's what he would call them, about their weekend that they had together. Why are you teaching children this in kindergarten? Why, why are you needing the feel that you can't, you, you need to be able to talk about that without parental permission? Go back to what we said grooming is. It's the deliberate act of creating this relationship with children in a secluded environment, the classroom, that you don't want parents to be in, isolation, where you're building trust because they, they you know, the teachers know you better than your parents and you're indoctrinating them into something that they themselves weren't come didn't come there for and you're morphing them into an ideology so that they can be then brought into this community of lgbt i'm sorry david french what part of this is not a groomer rich it, did i say anything in that that doesn't sound like a groomer absolutely not um but the the point that is not extremely clear in all of this is that a groomer in a broader sense, as these definitions show young people are being groomed to think a certain way and to accept certain behaviors. Maybe not necessarily because the person presenting the information has thoughts or plans or ideas to harm this child but they are wanting to shape and form their thinking for down the road. The, the, the more subtle grooming that's going on is basically a reprogramming of the American public to think and to normalize homosexual behavior, just like it has done when it comes to heterosexual behavior. All sexual immorality is wrong, but the problem is in the United States and this year now, and it's been going on since the 70s, just little by little, has become the normalization of sexual immorality, normalizing porn, normalizing sex outside of marriage, normalizing a man and a woman living together that are not married. And the problem is within Christianity, none of that has been objected to the point that it needed to be. None of that has been truly addressed. 
America is still the number one exporter of pornor pornographic material mm -hmm. in the world, still. And yet we stand around wondering why we're having to deal with issues about homosexuality being taught in kindergarten when the other, all other forms of sexual immorality is running rampant throughout the schools and it's being accepted as normal behavior. Now, all of a sudden, you're going to draw a line in the sand just because it's a sin you don't agree with. That is hypocrisy. Yeah. And, and to take a stand and say, this should not be taught in public schools. We should not have a lesbian teacher while you may have a teacher that's living with a man and it's known that they're living together and not married. And that's accepted as okay behavior. And you profess to be a Christian. Something is bad, bad off. Yeah. You have completely forgotten the point of the gospel and what it means to obey Christ and to love Christ and want to be sanctified in Christ. You don't embrace, endorse any form of sexual immorality. But the problem is people get reared up on their hind legs and go on their heels over this because now all of a sudden they're faced with a sin they don't agree with. Yeah. You know, all these other sins have become acceptable. I think it was Jerry Bridges wrote a book, Sins We Accept. Yeah. Well, you know, these other sins have become so acceptable and they're become such so normal place that nobody thinks anything about it. I was telling you in pre-show, I was just kind of scanning through some old television shows the other day. And it was a sci-fi show from like 1999 from the year two, or year 2000, somewhere right in there. And it's rated TV 14. And it had no ugly language in it. It had no nudity, in, no nudity in it. But it implied that a man and woman not married had had sexual relations together, and the woman was talking to another woman the next day about it. That is considered okay and acceptable. But in today's world, for a Christian, you know, if that had been two women in the bed together, they'd have been up in arms for the most part objectifying or not objectifying but saying how wrong that was but yet would sit back thinking that this other is completely acceptable behavior and that's what we're dealing with today is the fact that american christianity american evangelicalism has moved the goalpost back so far that i don't think it completely understands what sin is anymore much less what god actually teaches because it has accepted such worldly behavior and it has normalized it to a point to where they even they're blind to it i mean you cannot turn on a television or a movie or anything today without some form of grooming taking place whether it's shaping people to thinking that sex outside of marriage is okay or that homosexuality is okay that we need to be fighting for social justice blah 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 blah, blah. i mean it's just inundated just ongoing ongoing and ongoing and Disney, this is nothing new when you were talking about their plans to become more overtly pro-homosexual and pro-gay and during the characters. That's nothing new. It's just like all of a sudden people have woke up and said, ooh, Disney's promoting homosexuality. We better quit giving them our money. They've been doing this for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Where have you been? I mean, I know it's at least 30 years they've been having Gay Pride Day at their theme parks. But now that you're faced with it and and it's not a sin that you know over here off out of your sight and you don't have to think about it so you're not worried about it anymore now all of a sudden because they come out supporting you know this curriculum and and against this bill in florida now all of a sudden because it's made the headlines and people are talking about it you all of a sudden decide to wake up and and oh we got to do something about this well guess what you're about 40 years too late where have you been church yeah. Where have you been, pastors? Why haven't you been preaching against sexual immorality for the last 40 years? Why haven't you been standing on the foundation of the gospel and teaching people about sin and explaining sin and explaining how God sees sin in the lives of people? Where have you been? You've been asleep at the wheel. Now you're off in a ditch with your truck flipped upside down on fire, and you can't do anything about it. But there's only one thing we can do about it, because guess what? No legislation is going to outlaw sin in this country. Yeah. No legislation is going to save people's souls. 
it's time for the church to wake up and get back to the foundation of the Bible, the foundation of God's truth, and explain, define, and proclaim the biblical way of salvation, and explain and define sin like we did at the beginning of this show. People have got to realize that this world is temporary, that these things and everything that goes on around us now is temporary. As, a, as church, as Christians, our primary focus now more than ever should be about proclaiming the biblical way of salvation because that's the only hope for most of these people. Absolutely. The ones, that's not out, the, ones that's, the ones that are not truly saved in Christ. And guess what? I dare say 90% of people that profess to be Christians in this country are not truly Christians. Yeah. Not when they're standing either silently about heterosexual sins or they're speaking out against homosexual sins. Because guess what? If you're okay with one and against the other, that makes you a hypocrite. Yeah. And all of this originates from Satan. All of it originates and goes back to the Garden of Eden when Adam fell. Yeah. And the most prolific way that this is being distributed nowadays, and it's not just children, it's adults and teenagers and every age under the sun. Turn on the television set. The, the, the more time you spend in front of that TV screen or computer screen each day, the more you're getting exposed to it. Yeah. And sadly, for professing Christians, their children spend more time in front of a television set or spend more time listening to their parents talk about Star Wars or the latest Marvel movie than they ever do hearing their parents talk about Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that's sad. And that is the reality that we live in today. That's why I go back to what I said at the beginning of this show. Sin is the greatest enemy of mankind, and we only have one weapon against that, and that is the Word of God. Amen. Amen. And that's one of the things that I think there's so many people that right, I, I understand and am thor thoroughly behind being upset with what's going on. And I think David French's and many other you know, high-profile evangelicals arguments fall dead on their face but you're absolutely right how did we get here well we need to back the truck up so you know quite a few decades ago where we stopped preaching against sex outside of marriage where we stopped preaching against the, the evils of divorce and you know stopped saying those things because we were afraid that we might alienate people and drive them out and we didn't preach against the government and didn't preach against the corporations and the entertainment industry. We didn't do like John the Baptist and say, that is a sin. So we did help pave the way for this by failing to do so. Now, that's not to say there weren't churches that did. You take your places like Grace Community Church, John MacArthur. You take people like R.C. Sproul, who for decades have spoken out against this. Publicly so. Praise God for godly men who have done so. But many, many churches helped lay the, the, the foundation for this. Uh, I think it was um, R.C. Sproul who say, you know, said that with regard to you know, places like Planned Parenthood, there ought to be a sign in front of it says that, you know, here by permission of the church, because the church didn't stand up. And so I absolutely agree with you on that, brother. We have not taken up that uh, the place that we should be. So this is not to say that slinging the word around groomer solves the problem. This is addressing an attitude within high-profile evangelicalism, and it was something I posted the other day, and I'll just read this real quick. It says, The more I watch evangelical elites lecturing us common folk on our tone and how we ought to celebrate something because it's culturally correct, the more I recognize how much they want to befriend the world in hopes of making the church palatable. Yet it is not what the church is called to. We are called to be a lamp in the darkness pointing to the true light. We are a unique and set-apart people. We are to glorify God above all, calling the world to abandon all earthly pleasures and turn to Him who will give us eternal joy and peace. We cannot and will not ever be palatable to the world. We will not ever have a seat at the cultural table. We will always be the odd man out, the one who just doesn't fit in. We were made to be that way. We must stop 
seeking to court the world and return to being God's nation of priests, proclaiming repentance from sin and turning to Christ. We cannot celebrate what the world celebrates. We dare not taint the glory of God with that which the world finds acceptable. We must call out sin. We must tell the world that sin is abhorrent to God and he will judge. We must abandon all desire to be loved or even liked by the world. We must seek to desire to be humble and serve God alone. We must be willing to be to make much of him and have ourselves be eclipsed so that the world sees not us but the one who saves us. Ignore the elite. Stop making friends with the world. Speak the truth of God. Glorify him alone. When I hear people like David French and others saying, watch your tone. You can't say groomer. You can't. What are they saying? You're going to look bad to the world. That's not a nice thing to say. By the way, back to Justin Bullington. Listen to his podcast on uh, Should We Be Nice. I think it was a really good one. There is a difference between being nice and being kind. Kind means you say things that are hard to hear. Being nice is a different uh, is is a worldly concept that isn't something that's in scripture but french and others are trying to say we need to be nice we can't use this term go ahead rich i just wanted to add something that you just said and uh-huh. i'm pretty much closing out cuz we ran a little long but these evangel evangelites evangelitas <laughs> whatever evangelitas i like it evangelitas Let's let's just be blunt and to the point. They are ashamed of Jesus Christ. Yes. They're more concerned about the applause of man and the glory of man than they are in the glory of Jesus Christ. Period. They are ashamed <laughs> of Jesus Christ. They are ashamed of his word. They are ashamed of how he defines sin. The author of life, the author of everything, is the one that gets to define what is and what is not sin not some pastor, quote-unquote pastor, at some mega church because he has 5,000 attendees each week. He's not the author. He's not the Word of God. The Word of God is the Word of God. He doesn't get to redefine what thus saith the Lord. He is to obey Christ and love and teach others about Jesus Christ. He is to teach others to rise up and go forth and proclaim the Word of God. He is not to be a pundit at a pulpit trying to redefine society according to what Mr. Joe Smith over here says on his blog or on his television show. And that's sadly what we see going on among so many at the top of the American evangelical food chain. And it really and truly to me, it more comes back down to money, 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 money. Even within the SBC itself, it has watered down the gospel to the point to where it doesn't even look like the gospel anymore. I mean, after Tom Askell's points he made over the last week or so, I noticed the SBC annual convention pulled down the portion about get your discounted Disneyland tickets, but they they got so close, but they forgot to take out their little promotional video where they're still pumping Disneyland mm-hmm. like crazy, even amidst all of this. And, you know, it's like, Come to the SBC annual meeting, go to Disneyland, and while you're here, maybe pop into the convention for a time or for a a minute or two. I mean, it is so sad, even within the still what's considered, sadly considered, the most conservative Baptist or conservative denomination left, and all of the diversity and all the diversity talk going on within it. That's the problem. It already has too too much diversity. There's too much diversity among these pastors as to what actually is the gospel. They have too much diversity with the world already. They need Mm -hmm. to get back to the foundation of the Bible, which is the Word of God. And through all these worldly philosophies and trying to seem intelligent and seem appealing to the world, they need to get back and be more worried about what God thinks of them than what man thinks of them. And I don't know if we'll ever see it in our day or not, but... Honestly, I, I, I fear that when it comes to this world and this country, we're only going to see it get worse as time goes by. Mm-hmm. And if you're not out proclaiming the biblical way of salvation now, while it actually still is legal, you never will when it becomes illegal. Because I'm telling you, it's coming a day, and I think it's coming soon, 
when you will not be able to stand on a street corner or stand stand in a pulpit and say homosexuality is a sin because if you do you're going to be charged with a hate crime and i really truly believe that's coming soon because all you have to do is look at europe and look at england where that basically Mm -hmm. is already happening and we're on a very very fast track to becoming like europe the more these socialist politicians we have in office like biden the quicker we're going to get there and europe and england is the model that they want to get us to yeah and there's only one weapon we have against that and that's the word of god and we can't just wave our swords around with the scabbard on we've got to pull that scabbard off and release that sword which is the gospel of jesus christ sadly even within the sbc they're, ho- they're holding the scabbard up talking about how pretty it is and how well it's polished and <laughs> all these gems and diamonds that it's got and they're never drawing the sword out they're never re- unleashing the word of god to do what it's intended to do and that's pierce through the heart marrow and bone of mankind to expose the sinful desires that are inside each man's heart yeah because yeah. the bible says you know there's darkness and there's light there's no in between and sadly today too far too many are trying to still ride that fence post with one leg in the word of god and one leg in the world and it doesn't work that way yeah. and we're faced more and more with these type of discussions and debates and legislation and everything else and the church sadly well when i say the church i don't mean the true body of christ because it has not failed but those that profess to be the church that profess to be in christ they're more concerned with their comfort and entertainment and being able to stream 20 hours of this superhero show than they are about the word of god yeah amen Amen. So let's let's put a point on this. We want you to always go back to the Word of God. That we want you to filter your lens, or your lens should always be the Word of God. That's what you filter everything through. So the argument of people like French and others is that you you have to kind of silence how you talk about this. You can't use words like rumor and stuff. Why? Well, they have a standard of hypocrisy that I don't think stands up. But they think that that somehow prevents you from saying these harsh, these harsh condemnatory statements about what is gross sin. Um, it ignore they're ignoring the reality of what's happening in the culture. Don't say groomer. You can't. Don't call them groomers. That's not nice. And the reality is, it's a mass-produced form of grooming, rather than an individual pedophile trying to victimize a child or several children. You have. Uh, schools, medias, corporations, governments trying to manipulate an entire generation and, and, and to manipulate them into this uh, sexual mores that they approve of. It's happening at a mass level and the culture at large is seeking to lead children in sin against God. Well, what, did, what does God have to say about causing p- children to sin? Luke 17, 12 Jesus said it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Every organization, every political leader, every person who is screaming that they want to have unfettered access to children so they can teach them these sexually deviant, sinful behaviors is standing before God with a judgment that it would be better that they would be drowned in the depths of the sea with a stone around their neck. That's how serious God takes leading children into sin. So that's issue number one. Issue number two, parents, you are the ones to teach your children. You are the ones to teach them to obey God. You don't get to abdicate this and give it to the schools and expect the schools to do it right. How do I know this? Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. 
That was God's command to Israel about the, the book of the law. Do you think that God has abdicated that for you as a parent? That you are to don't have a responsibility to teach your children to obey God in all things, even how we are to live sexually? By the way, God has commanded us about sexuality. It's confined to the marriage of one man and one woman in a lifelong monogamous relationship. Go to Genesis 24 and Matthew 19.9. Jesus did speak, by the way, of that. He said, have you not read that he who created at the beginning made them male and female and, you know, and, and, and referred to marriage as God's institution? So Jesus did absolutely speak affirmatively of biblical marriage. But God created marriage. That's the only relationship that is a sexual, a moral sexual relationship is allowed. It's not outside it. It's not pre, pre-marriage. It's not with anybody else. It's with a husband and wife that God has brought to you for all of your life. And there's only one allowable reason for divorce. Any Sexual act outside of the relationship that God designed is sin. Go to Exodus 20, 14 and Matthew 5, 28. By the way, even looking with lust, that Matthew 5, 28 reference, on someone who is not your wife or your spouse is sin. Any LGBT type sexuality is an abomination in the eyes of God. Go to Leviticus 20, 13, Deuteronomy 22, 5 and Romans chapter 1. It is God's design and God's command of who we are, how we are made, who we are made to be, and how we as parents are to teach our children. Any person or group that seeks to supplant the role of the parent and to teach children to sin against God are being groomed to be wretched, vile, rebel sinners against God. That's what they're doing. They're training your children grooming them to rebel against God and rebel against your authority, the person in, that has been put over them by God. French and other evangel- evangelical elitists, how to, evangel- elitists, how did you say that? Evan- um, e- evangel- evangelitists. Evangelists. There we go. We're gonna have to. We, we're gonna have to help have Dara help us with making up words. That one was tough. Uh, <laughs> but when they say you're not being nice, you, that's not right to call someone a groomer. They are saying to you, you don't have the right to call people who Jesus himself said it would be better that they be drowned in the depths of the sea with a millstone about their neck. You shouldn't say that. That's not nice. These are people that are leading our children to sin. They are grooming them for gross sin. I'm sorry. David French and those individuals that support what things that he says are simply dead wrong. Now, does calling him a groomer solve the problem? Absolutely not. I'm not. We're going to do this uh, this podcast so you guys can go streaming across the internet and yell yell at every person from Disney on down and all the school districts and say you're all groomers. That's not what we did the episode for. We're addressing the attitude and the the so-called logic behind this argument. It is illogical, it is wrong, it is unbiblical. Because it is utterly rejecting the truth of Scripture, and it is putting upon those who are recognizing what is actually happening on a massive scale, a grooming of a generation of children to sin against God, and saying, you can't say that because, number one, you voted for this guy. And number two, that's not a nice word. That's just dead wrong. It's a, it's, it's a horrible argument. And they need to repent of that. And they need to stand up. And we all need to do this. We need to stand up and we need to be like John the Baptist, and, and who says, Herod, it's not right that you have your brother's wife. We need to have that boldness. 
to speak to the world and say, you are inviting the judgment of God upon yourself and upon the nation as you lead these children into sin. Repent and turn to Christ. Because Rich is right. Right now that law sits in Florida. And it might survive getting up to the Supreme Court. Because right now, even with the newest Supreme Court justice, and no, I do not celebrate her simply because of her, her ethnicity and her gender. I do not celebrate people who give a slap on the wrist to actual pedophiles and uh, who, who promote child slaughter in the womb by at the same time saying, I don't know how to define what a woman is. I don't celebrate that, sorry. That, that, that person doesn't belong on the Supreme Court. But we need to speak this truth of the gospel to the world because even if that law survives, even if it makes it to the Supreme Court and survives, all it takes is the next governor to come in who's not as sympathetic to parents' roles in the lives of children, and that thing's gone. A stroke of the pen can remove it. It's not that hard, and it doesn't stop the wicked hearts that are bound and determined to lead children to sin. The church must stand up. The church must preach the gospel. The very message we started this episode with. It must preach the gospel and call to repentance the, our culture at large. It is the only way that you change a heart bent on corrupting a child. We don't preach the gospel to keep them from doing it. We preach the gospel so that they will be saved. But the product of that, a heart, saved heart, does not want to wit corrupt children. But it also has the uh, uh, another effect that on the day of judgment, they cannot say they did not know. The condemnation is even greater. Because they had the gospel given to them and they rejected it. In the hardness of their heart, they rejected it. Church, don't fear people like David French who say, how dare you use that word? You have no right. Speak the truth. Call them what they are. They are grooming your children for sin. And they are grooming them to sexual sin. So they can use them for their sordid, disgusting lifestyles. To promote that. That is absolutely grooming. But I think even Daryl's got it even better. It's sexually deviant predation call it what it is don't fear elitists like French and others they have no truth when they try to make friends with the world this way don't be jerks we don't want to be jerks for Jesus but we can speak the truth firmly passionately boldly and with tears in our eyes even calling them to repentance but do not fear the elitists, they have nothing to offer. Stand boldly, proclaim the truth, do not waver. Rich, anything before we let them go? I just want to remind our brothers and sisters in Christ that God gave the command to Adam and Eve to go forth and multiply. Well, that same command is given to every true born-again Christian today. We're to go forth and proclaim the biblical way of salvation because we are ambassadors of Christ and we have been given the ministry of reconciliation and we are commanded to go produce more fruit bearing trees by proclaiming the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, defining sin, telling each person how they can be reconciled to God as we did at the beginning of this show. So whatever you do this week, make it a point at least once a day to go forth and proclaim the biblical way of salvation. Amen. Amen. Folks, we try not to hit you with these sensitive topics very often, but show's over. You can let the kids back in. <laughs> um, went much longer than I anticipated. I really kind of wanted to keep this one tight. I appreciate your guys' patience with us uh, on this episode. Maybe make up for not being here last week. Um, Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much 
for your continued support, your prayers, uh, the fact that you share the program, the fact that you, you tune in. Uh, we are grateful for you. We hope that we have honored God with this episode. Uh, we hope that we have edified you in, in what we have done today. And we have encouraged you in some way. If we have, we'd love to hear from you. Please don't forget, you can always reach out to us, voiceofreasonradio at gmail.com. Uh, or you can go to our website, slavetothekeen.com. That's another way you can reach out to us. Um, if you take issue with what we say, hey, I got no problem with that. Uh, just be respectful when you when you write to us, and uh, you know, and definitely uh, you know, keep it clean. And 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 if you're going to bring Bible verses, please bring them in context. We've said this many many times. Um, thankfully, we don't really get too many um, folks that have gone on the assault with us on that. We appreciate that. Um, people who have had questions, you, know, you guys are really great about reaching out to us. Um, some of the comments that we've been seeing on the on the face or not Facebook, but the uh, website, uh, you guys are great. Um, somebody actually reached out and, and wanted that uh, that uh, Puritan Sinner's Prayer. I thought that was great. Uh, we were able to share that. If you can actually find that in the comment section, if you're curious about the link, uh, you go to the last show, male and female. Uh, no, yeah, male and female. He created them. You can uh, you can find that there. Uh, it's in the comments. If you are if you are curious about that one, uh, but thank you again for uh, your time. We're so grateful for you guys. We look forward to talking to you next time. God bless. Good night. We'll see you next time.